So, Japan, the land of the rising sun, mecca to all things nerdy and smelly. Japan is the place that every person who likes anime has talked about going to at least once or twice, but the amount of people that actually go is hit and miss, and a lot of it is because setting up an actual trip to Japan is a pain in the ass. It's a lot of time, money, effort, especially if you want to take multiple people, but this boy right here actually managed to do it. So this video will go over some of the shenanigans we got up to and some general advice for people interested in going. Yeah, the Japan saga was a long-awaited moment for the channel. It was sort of a celebration for how far we've come and proof that we could organize a big event sort of thingy. So we made a stream goal for roughly 8,000 bucks, and when that was reached, it was stretched to double the amount to account for some real-life friends that wanted to join in on the trip. Altogether, it was me, my buddy I do streams with by the name of Shoda, codenamed Irishman, and codenamed Weedbro. It was a four-man group, and altogether, the estimated amount for how much it would cost was 16,000. Since, shocker, setting up a vacation for two weeks in a foreign country can get pricey. It's always safer to overshoot your goal than undershoot, you know? But thanks to some sneaky bargain hunting, I managed to actually should get a decent place for everybody, along with a round-trip flight both ways. The expectation was 16k, but managed to get both of these for like 9500 There's some ways I managed to weasel this. First, I booked several months in advance, specifically in December, during holiday season. Tons of hotels do bundle deals during that time to get reservations, because sometimes later seasons can get kind of slow, you know, before major summer events or anything like that, and some of them are pretty nuts. Brand you have to pay attention to the fine print, because some hotels like to sneak in gratuities or hidden fees. I used Booking.com for the process, and they claim to disclose every fee, so you're not hit with something you weren't expecting, but truth of the matter is you just won't be sure until you get there. Kind of a funny story is that uh, on the hotel fee, on the actual like itinerary they give you when they email you, it said I owed $27,000 and I was freaking the fuck out for several weeks, but it turns out uh, that was just them fucking up because it was 27,000 yen, which if you convert that to regular America dollars, it's like maybe 300 bucks. Luckily, it wasn't anywhere near as bad as I was expecting, but keeping an extra grand or two as like an emergency fund is just a good idea. Also, keep a credit card on hand in case anything happens. You know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Mindset's good to have. We flew out of Louisville and from there transferred to a different flight out of Chicago, and we did get lucky with the delays where we had plenty of time to catch our breath and figure out where to go next without being, you know, stuck in the airport. Layovers can be annoying, but having one isn't the worst, especially if you're going to an airport you never went to before and you have no idea where you're going. But once we were up in the air and going to Tokyo, it was said and done. It was just a 13-hour flight. I found out the hard way I can't sleep on a plane. Like, at all. I had to binge the last season of Better Call Saul just to pass the time. It wasn't fun. It wasn't fun at all. So the specific hotel we stayed at was the Tobu Levant, which is in the dead middle of Tokyo, in a district called Kinchicho, I think it was. It was a 30-minute walk from the Sky Tree, and our room actually had a view of it, and it was pretty cool. Plus, it was right across the street from a bunch of different restaurants and stores. Hell, on the second floor platform, they had a family mart, not even a stone throw away from the door. You essentially had a Walgreens stitched to the hotel you could walk to, and you didn't have to worry about getting wet if it rained. It was pretty sweet. Now, the obvious thing to get out of the way is the language barrier and currency exchange. In our experience, language wasn't too much of a problem in Japan. Not that everyone spoke fluent English, more that it was clear that the people were used to dealing with foreigners that couldn't speak Japanese. They were quick to gesture to signs or give simple phrases that point you where you needed to go. So, for example, if you went into the family mart to buy a drink, then they would say something like swipe card or do you need bag. Easy sentences you catch on to. Plus, the actual registers would display text in Japanese and English, which helped a lot. As stated, it's clear how aware they are of foreigners who have trouble grasping the language. The actual staff at the hotel spoke it pretty well. The lady at the counter who checked us in even gave advice on how to avoid an upcharge when I paid for the room. Apparently, paying in USD lets you avoid taxes if you paid in yen, which was cool. She was nice. She was also kind of pretty, I'm not even gonna lie. The currency exchange was easy too. Stores could take our debit cards because they were visas, so it's not really doing anything different from going to the store normally. Only real thing to watch out for is big purchases, like if you wanted to buy a very expensive bottle of booze, because even if you make your bank aware that you're going overseas, they'll freak out and halt some transactions. Which is, on one hand, annoying. But on the other, it's weird to get mad about that because they think they're trying to keep you from losing money. Still, for actual currency exchange, there was a terminal in the hotel. We were worried about not finding a place to swap when we first arrived, but they actually popped up in more than a few places. In the hotel, in some stores, I think there was even some in the metro terminals. Now, for what we actually did, for the first day or two, we were completely knocked out due to jet lag. It fucked us up bad, to the point we had to force ourselves to wake up and get breakfast in the hotel. Which I will say, the Tobu Levant has a pretty good fucking breakfast. They have, like, actual chefs make it, you know, like, dudes who know how to cook, and it was really good. There were also little robots that would take your dishes, and that, that was the best part. I love that little robot. 
we were seriously considering stealing it. Regardless, the point is we had to work our asses off towards just fixing our internal clock so we can actually do things. There's a reason I picked like two weeks, even though when I was talking to my family about this trip, they were insisting I do it for five days, where I'm just like, no, no, I'm not going to a foreign fucking country halfway across the world for less than a week. Yeah, very big warning, don't take jet lag lightly. It's a vicious mistress that will fuck you up sideways. You will fall asleep at 5 in the afternoon and wake up at 4 a.m. wide awake. Your brain's gonna be scrambled for a bit until you get used to their time zone. Best you can do is force yourself outside, get sunlight, and drink a lot of water. Which is actually funny in our case, because as soon as we got into the country, a fucking typhoon hit. Not even kidding, a full-blown typhoon. Woke up the second day to see our floor on the hotel was engulfed in a cloud. Plus side gave us an excuse to sleep in. Downside, we thought it would be a smart idea to walk around in said typhoon to get a grasp of the area, because we were used to America rain, where it's an issue but not really anything bad unless it's a full-blown storm. Turns out Japan leans more on that side, because by the end of the walk we were a bunch of wet dogs. Humidity alone made our clothes sopping wet and the rain only made it worse. It was a miserable experience walking around, and we soon understood the importance of those umbrellas they sold everywhere. Also the walking in general. Yeah, Japan's a very walk-heavy nation. If you're not used to it and you have bad shoes, you're not gonna have a fun time. Which applied to me in both cases. Yeah, it got so bad I had to go to a department store next to the hotel and pick up a new pair of shoes. It was fucking misery on my feet. I already walked on rubber for a bit, since my old soles were so worn down. The rest of the group was way more used to the walking, so they didn't have any issues. Yeah, I, I was like miles behind them the whole time. It was uh, pretty embarrassing. But this was a ways into the trip, so the first several days it was just enduring some of the worst shoes for walking that you could have possibly had. But the first goal of the trip was the sky tree, because it was literally staring us in the face. Just a quick little walk, and we were right there. It also kind of let us get a vibe of the place, letting us get into the atmosphere and enjoy the walk. Took a bunch of pictures, and that was cool. Got some shrines, a graveyard, various alleys. It was just kind of fun looking around. Because yeah, it's completely different from how our town structure looks in America. Granted, this was also in the middle of a major city, so that also played a factor, but you get my point. It looked different than what we used to, so ape go ooh. The sky tree itself was actually pretty damn fun. The tower is connected to this mall underneath that's a major tourist destination. There was even a magic show. Tons of tour groups had the same idea of going to the sky tree. There was even a little kid who kept walking up to us and like waving, and his dad kept trying to like shush him away but he kept running back. It, it, it was funny, and we felt really bad for the dead. But still, it was a hassle getting into the tree itself. The view of the city, though, made it all worth it. Also, two of my buddies nearly had panic attacks due to being freaked out by the heights, so that was funny. Still, the tower itself was split between two levels. You had the general floor, which had like a snack bar and a gift shop, and was packed with people. But the level above it was more focused and sort of a quick walk around the tower's near tip. It had some collaboration with Disney going on at the time, so it was filled with a bunch of decorations with Disney princesses and stuff like that. Yeah, it was kind of cool. A little cheesy, but you know, fuck it, it was a tourist spot. Skytree is definitely a spot to check out since you really see how far the entire city stretches. It can mess with your head in a good way. Now, after the Sky Tree was our journey to the Promised Land, the thing Japan is known for across the world and the must-stop destination for anyone who even thinks about going. That's right, Don Quixote. <laughs> For those unaware, Don Quixote is a major store brand in Japan. There's locations in other countries, apparently there's even one in Hawaii, but most everybody who isn't from Japan might only recognize it from the Yakuza games. Well, we actually had a Don Quixote right across the street from the hotel, and we made an effort to go over there and see if it lives up to the hype. I will say, it's an interesting place. You can buy chips, drinks, hard liquor, cosplay stuff, sex toys, it really has everything. We actually went to two of these, one in the area our hotel was at in Kinchicho, and later a much larger one in Yokohama. That was straight up a big grocery store with multiple floors. And that was cool because it sold grain liquor by entire liters. I think alcoholism might be an issue over there. Still, Don Quixote was fun. Even if the aisles weren't built for big fat Americans, yeah, when it got busy, it could definitely feel suffocating. And yes, there were multiple flavors of Kit Kats. It's almost obligatory to mention how many variations of Kit Kats you can find in Japan. Sake flavored ones weren't bad, but the strawberry shortcake ones were a million times better. I will fight entire wars on this. Still, it was our first experience dealing with a Japanese store, especially a big city one. America stores, you know, in small towns where we're at, can be very compact. You have single Single floor, your aisles, and that was it. Find your shit, get out. Don Quixote, even the one across from our hotel, had multiple floors, each one being a different department, so like electronics be on the third floor, food and snacks on the fourth, booze and sex stuff on the fifth, you get the idea. Sex stuff isn't a joke, by the way, they straight up had vibrators and like cosplay for sex. They are in fact vibrators. They're also bottle openers shaped like dicks. 
We ended up coming here more than a few times, mainly because it had more stuff than the Family Mart, and it gave us an excuse to get out and get fresh air. Now, the subject I'm excited to talk about is the food. The food was some of the greatest shit I've ever eaten in my whole life. No exaggeration. Because we were dumb Americans who couldn't read signs, we didn't really go out to eat much, mostly just relied on delivery apps like DoorDash or whatever the equivalent was, so we don't remember the actual names of places. Also, it was all in kanji, so that really didn't help. Still, the standouts were as follows. Actual, legit ramen, beef bowl, Japanese-style pizza, which was just, eh, not really worth mentioning, and tonkatsu, cafe-style sandwich, and coffee, and yakisoba, and some other stuff was mixed in as well, like various snacks and things like that. Uh, melon bread is really good, and I will be ordering a whole bunch off Amazon. I don't give a fuck anymore. And most all of it was pretty damn tasty. The beef bowl and ramen being absolute favorites that I still think about to this day. I mean, yeah, real legit ramen is a step above just the cheap crap you pick up for like 80 cents for a cheap lunch. Came with cooked chicken and a bone broth. Yeah, it was uh, insanely good. Now, learning how to use the chopsticks to eat wasn't too painful. It definitely was awkward at first, but give it some time and soon, it's something you don't really even think about. It's just about realizing how to place your pointer finger, and from there, your hand kind of just naturally adjusts your placement. It still is a hassle, and it's going to take some time and some tinkering, but so long as you stick with it, you'll pick it up pretty easily. Regardless, even the local places kicked the ass of a lot of fast food places back in America. Maybe it's just from trying it the first time or what, but it really was a noteworthy piece of the trip. We did also try Japanese Burger King, and that came with like an entire pound-sized burger with like four patties that, oh god, I don't want to think about that anymore. And we did try Japanese KFC. It was pretty mid. It tasted like a less greasy version of American KFC, so there you go. Official, official Kentuckian review of, of Japanese KFC. It was, it was mid. Now, in regards to the metro system, it wasn't too bad. It took a little bit of getting used to with figuring out what lines go on to where and where they lead, but it's simple enough. As stated, a lot of the signs are in Japanese and English, so it's pretty easy to keep a note in your head of where you're going. You don't have to stumble around looking for a way to translate everything, and it's pretty dirt cheap. Unless you're going somewhere crazy far away, most tickets didn't cost more than like 200 yen, which isn't even $2 there. And yeah, those trains could get super crowded. That urban legend is proven true. The amount of molestations, Still undecided. I need to remember what was a molestation and what was just some old guy trying to get his phone. Sometimes of days, Alright became walking into a fishnet. Everyone squished against each other. In regards to that thing where you're not supposed to talk on the train, it was sort of hit and miss. Some people didn't give a fuck and had full conversations, others wrote it dead silent. Thing we learned while over there is that you won't know if a lot of the urban legends about Japan are true until you get there and you just stumble around like an idiot. Even then, it's a coin flip if you'll run into anything or not. Shocker, reality's more complicated than just having every television show on the planet mention the panty vending machines. I mean, there were a shitload of vending machines, but they didn't sell panties, mostly Picari sweat, which I'm now addicted to and I will never seek help for. It's society that needs to change, not me. Still, once the metro system was mastered, with minimal train gropings both inflicted and suffered, we made our way to Akihabara, perhaps one of the most famous districts in the entire country, widely known as the Anime District. Since a ton of anime shops, electronic stores, maid cafes, what have you are over there. And yeah, it's definitely trippy when you get there for the first time. Tons of people are flowing in and out, and there was a big-ass river flowing through it. It was free, too. You could just, like, stand there and look at the river. Shit was wild. We tried to look at some of the merch stores, but holy crap, can they get pricey. Couldn't find a single Berserk statue that wasn't close to a grand each. And that was if I could even find one in the first place. Also, we were apparently in Akihabara on the same day as a bunch of different YouTube people, so I'm gonna take the time to apologize for not jumping them in the streets. That's our bad guys. We failed you. We'll fuck them up next time. Regardless, it was a fun experience, especially since we got there right as everything was at their busiest. Though, it needs to be said, I did not appreciate being gaslit by that one maid cafe. We swore we'd never step foot in one, because they're money traps. They're there to bleed money out of dumb tourists and horny idiots. But when we were checking out one of the merch stores, it was connected to a maid cafe and a completely separate cafe that was a floor above that one. Well, we wanted to sit down and take a break and, and kind of catch our bearings for the day, so we wanted to check out that cafe. When I decided to take the elevator up to the floor where the unrelated cafe was, it just led to a door on the roof. There was, there was nothing there. It was empty. Underneath it was the maid cafe, so that was available, but the store that had nothing to do with that just led to the roof. They trick you into thinking there's a floor above, but you always wind up back in the maid cafe. And when I tried to escape on the elevator, a maid followed me. And as we were trying to get back on the metro system, I kept noticing maids in the streets. It's a terrifying place. I, I, I don't think I can recommend going to Akihabara. Also, I wanted to get more footage and pics, but a lot of places flat out banned using cameras. Could use my phone, but the battery on it isn't the best. 
and I guess they're annoyed at tourists bringing out big cameras to take pictures and video of everything. It makes sense, it's a privacy issue, plus they can be pretty bulky, but I mean, you know, I bought the damn thing to take pictures. Still, I got what I could, but we didn't just stay in Akihabara. There was a shrine temple just outside the district that we decided to check out, and it was really nice. One of the goals of the trip was to check out an old temple, so this was the perfect opportunity to do just that. Yeah, we left Akihabara so we could check out an old historical temple. We're boring. Do you want to fight about it? Still, the area was gorgeous, though it was definitely out of the way. I mean, it's a walk. You have to leave Akihabara, walk maybe a few blocks down the road, go up a hill. Yeah, altogether for the day, we walked close to 10 miles. But it was worth it, because just the architecture alone really sells how pretty some of the sites can be. Of course, this was the day that the issue with the shoes got to their worst, like I had blisters the size of jawbreakers bad. Buddy in the group had to go out and buy Epsom salt just so I could soak my feet. Shit really sucked. Don't neglect your shoes, bros. Especially if you're going to a foreign country that really promotes walking everywhere. Still, after the Akihabara day, we decided to do laundry at the place just across the street from the hotel. And I have no fucking clue how these laundromats work. Just buy a fucking washing machine, do it yourselves. Don't pay for a basic feature, you heathens. Regardless, the day after was the actual Tokyo Tower itself. The area around it was really intricate, and you had to pass through another shrine to get up to it. The rest of the group went up since the tower sits on a hill, but this was the point where the shoe issue got just way way out of hand. As stated, this was the day after walking up to like 10 miles in Akihabara, so the worn down pieces of shit I had wearing on my feet uh, ate them to pieces, and then the day after we decided to do another excursion, it just was not the best idea and I had to take multiple breaks just to get some relief, so personally never made it up to the tower. But I did get plenty of time to look around the area surrounding it, a big ass park, another shrine, a luxury hotel, really interesting stuff, also a bunch of pigeons, they were everywhere. It was cool. We also went to some aquariums while we were over there. The one under the sky tree had tons of penguins. They're also pretty cool. There was even a whole chart where you could track all the, you know, family lineages of the penguins in the tank so you could see who their ancestors were. I liked that. It was really, it was, it was really cool. They also had some, like, late night market exhibit with a bunch of goldfish. It looked nice. Plus sea turtles. The aquarium was very fun moving on. Next on the list was the Walking Gundam. Yeah, you might not know about it, but there's a Walking Gundam exhibit in Yokohama. They're slowly trying to build an actual moving Gundam. Granted, it's still super early, but it is cool nonetheless. And it's made some pretty big leaps from when it started. At first, only being able to move its head slightly, to now being able to move its arms, head, and legs. They even have like a radio performance or something play whenever they show off its movement. <laughs> There was even a museum there that talks about how they built it, the history of robotics, and the plans they had for the future. Really neat place, definitely worth the journey to get there, cause you gotta walk all the way to a harbor next to the ocean. Still, it's tons of fun, even spent money on some Gumpla shit. I will not get addicted to the plastic crack, this was just to prove that I went there. The last real big event we had for the trip was the Mount Fuji journey. Yeah, we actually said fuck it and decided to go to Mount Fuji. Originally, the plan was to also hit Aokigahara, the suicide forest, but we just couldn't get there to make it work. I mean, there was no time, and it was the last few days, plus the weather was getting really bad, so we just stuck with Fuji instead. To get there, we had to take a train from Kinshicho to Shinjuku Station, then take an express train down to the base of the mountain, where we had like a little town, and it was pretty wild going from ultra urban urban Tokyo to a smaller mountain town. It was still pretty bustling, but the shift was there. Still, from there we took a bus up the mountain, which was around a 40 minute drive both to and from. So a bit of a journey, but not terrible. And when we got to the peak, we got hit by the temperature difference. We were used to ultra humid and hot Japan summer season, but towards the peak of the mountain, it dropped to like mid 40s. Shit got chilly, plus the wind. Regardless, it was pretty cool. There were a bunch of different shops to look at, and I ended up getting most of the souvenirs from there. Stuff like a geisha statue, a lucky charm, a hand fan, a whole bunch of stuff. We also tried to smuggle out the Buddhist Bible from the hotel, but uh, decided against it in fear of any curses following us back home. I was already being stalked by maids, I didn't want to piss off Buddha. Now to actually get home from Mount Fuji was a journey itself. So 
we did not have the time to get to the express train that would take us right back to Shinjuku and from there Kenshicho. Uh, instead, we decided to take the normal metro system and try to trace the steps the express train would go and essentially just kind of do it stop by stop. It was a good idea on paper, but when we got to the halfway point, one of the workers at the metro station miscalculated where we were going and so sent us on a completely different train that, if I honestly had to guess, was probably taking us to fucking Kyoto. And from there, we had to stumble our way, you know, close to dead of night on various metro systems, hopping from train to train to find our way home. It took about an hour to get to Mount Fuji altogether. It took about three to get back. It was rough. Figure out the metro system, bros. It's just a good idea. Now, the only actual story left is when two of my buddies in the group decided to go get shitfaced at a bar, because they were complaining all fucking trip how they wanted to go drinking at a bar, and we just never really did. Well, the night decided to do that, Shota ended up getting a sinus infection, so didn't want to go out drinking, and I just didn't want to go. So, it ended with the two of them getting so drunk they had hangover-style shenanigans while trying to get back to the hotel, including, but not limited to, falling asleep on the street, losing their passports, pissing on a guy's tire, and losing a pair of pants. Yes, they lost a pair of pants. All this the day before the flight home. So the hours leading up to us going to the airport were full of scrambling around, Tokyo, trying to find our friend's passport so they weren't trapped in the country. Guys, if you're gonna take anything away from this, let it be this. Watch your drink count on the day before a flight. Regardless, it was a great time. Beautiful culture, great food, and the police were super nice with only minimal amounts of hating the very ground we walked on. Though in all fairness, that's probably due to the sheer annoyance of trying to help hungover foreigners find their passports. This is a really different video from what I usually do, so really not too sure how this should all be structured. Mainly just going off the cuff, stream of consciousness type deal. Still, this was fun. The trip itself was great, and hopefully this will inspire you guys to start planning your own Japan sagas. As stated, it's something that can be cheaper than you expected, so long as you plan it right and know when to book everything. I know we didn't get up to as many shenanigans as what other people do, but we're old and boring and we had no idea how to make YouTube content. Plus, we mostly kept it to walking around and feeling the vibe of Japan. Actual attractions and stuff to do is covered by guys like Abroad in Japan, who do good work showing what you can get up to. This is just sort of an everyman visit foreign country for first time deal. Regardless, I hope this gets you guys interested in checking out Japan for yourselves. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. They got chickens. They have chickens and cute Japanese girls shaking their hands. Hey, loser. Do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're going to be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's going to look at you funny. There's going to be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're going to plant crack in your house, and they're going to arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.